All right, welcome everyone. I call the December 8, 2020 Bothell Regular City Council meeting to order. Before we move on to the agenda items, I'd like to acknowledge our remote meeting format. Proclamation 20-28 regarding open public meetings is still in effect. Therefore, this meeting will be held entirely remotely. Public comment will be allowed, both in writing or verbally. Sign-up sheets were provided by the city clerk's office via links from the agenda. The video of this meeting will be streamed live as well as recorded and available for later viewing on the city's YouTube channel. A call-in number was provided on the meeting agenda for members of the public who wish to call in by phone to listen live to the meeting. If you have called in, we ask that you mute your device so as not to interfere with the meeting. If a participant fails to mute their connection and causes a disruption to the meeting, their connection will be terminated. For our phone-in callers, during staff presentation, staff will make every effort to specify which materials they're referencing so everyone can follow along. So at this point, we'll take roll call of the council members by position. Please say here when the city clerk calls your name. Deputy Mayor Zorns. Here. Council Member Thompson. Here. Council Member McAuliffe. Council Member McNeil. Councilmember McNeil. I am here. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Olson. Here. Councilmember Doerr. Here. Councilmember Agnew. Here. I'm showing all present with the exception of Councilmember McAuliffe. All right, I understand Councilmember McAuliffe is getting set up in uh, one of the rooms here, so she'll be on shortly. So lastly, before we begin, I'd like to reiterate some of our guidelines. So speak clearly and pause frequently. Uh, mute your microphone when not speaking. If you're also streaming the live video feed, please turn the sound off as there is a delay. So for our council members, if you'd like to speak, please indicate by holding up a yellow card in the lower portion of your screen. This will help eliminate two people speaking at the same time. Remember, please mute your microphone when you're not speaking. And remember that unmute button, that darn little button. All right, so our first item here, uh, meeting agenda approval. Are there any changes to tonight's agenda? All right, seeing none, uh, moving on to presentations and reports. So we have a present special presentation, uh, buildable lands and growth targets, Kirsten Mant. Just a second to panel her in. Please. Yep. Hello, uh, good evening, Mayor Olson and members of the City Council. And thank you for having me here tonight. Um, I'll just be giving a pretty brief presentation about, oops, sorry, my video's not on yet, about our uh, build buildable lands work we've done to date. Let me get my screen shared here. All right, so first a quick overview. So as it, it's sort of most general, and I know uh, many of you are familiar with this, the Buildable Lands Report, the goal is really just to estimate what is our remaining capacity here in the city, um, looking at what is the developable area that's left, what are uh, the existing regulations that inform our potential capacity that's left, and uh, sort of past patterns. And then these estimates will go into informing our comp plan updates for the 2024 uh, comprehensive plan update. We do have separate growth targets that come out of this work in uh, King County and Snohomish County being split between the two. Uh, because of that, we also do have a little bit of uh, different methodology and process for the work that we do with the separate counties. And then just to give an idea of where we've gone through the last 20 years, just showing a bit of what the population change has been. So we've seen obviously steady growth, particularly in the last five to six years. There's a quick jog there from an annexation in King County. I think that was 2012 or 2013. So that's what that's there for. 
And then looking at the numbers, so for King County, we have uh, targets set from the prior work that run from 2006 to 2035. This is our current target. And since uh, in the last, in, from 26 to 2018, uh, we've, it's about a 41% of the time elapsed to the 2035 target. And as you can see here, we've already exceeded that by quite a bit, both housing units and definitely for jobs in King County. Uh, we have the same target time range for Snohomish County, uh, obviously slightly different targets. And you can see we're basically on pace with our housing, a little bit behind, but year to year that kind of changes. It's not really a straight line in terms of development. So we're pretty happy with that. And in terms of jobs, we're again, pacing pretty far ahead. So we're doing pretty well there. In terms of the work on this year's buildable land support, what we've done to date with King County so far has mostly been the data collection analysis of that data, working with our GIS staff and the King County's uh, GIS staff to get to that point. And our ongoing work throughout the winter and the early spring is to meet with the King County staff, other core cities to discuss what we've done so far, what potential targets we might be looking at uh, with a goal to um, eventually have this report finished by the end of the month that has to be sent off at the end of June. Snohomish County, again, a little different. We have a little bit less uh, hands on the actual data work that goes on with Snohomish County. They tend to do more of that themselves, but we have been meeting with them to finalize the methodology for the report. And that's really the methodology for determining what is considered developable area. So we finished that work up in June, approving the methodology, and we're actually meeting with them this week on a Friday to go over some of the initial data. And again, buildable lands report is also due at the end of June for Snohomish County. And so where we're at now with estimates, again, with Snohomish County, we don't really have a ton of information yet. We will know more after Friday. Uh, for King County, we're very, very early days in terms of the growth targets that will be set for us. Uh, we do have some initial capacity estimates. So you can see up there, we have about, about uh, 4,500 housing units over about 290 acres of residential land that's uh, developable. About 4,200 jobs and we can see our growth target range. Again, a very, very initial estimate, pretty wide range. Um, that's sort of the low end to the high end that they've given us. And over the next few months, we'll start looking at kind of titrating that down to what ultimately will work um, amongst all the core cities and will work for us. So in terms of next steps, as I mentioned, we're continuing to just draft and refine targets throughout the winter and early spring. Uh, they've given a goal, the county has told us they have a goal to have a draft of their buildable lands report by the beginning of June, so, we, so they can edit that over the course of the month. Um, as I noted earlier, Snohomish County, we don't have a ton of information yet, but more likely than not, we'll have a fairly similar uh, timeline to King County. And that is really all for me right now. So I will go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And if you all have any questions, I can go ahead and answer those for you now. Councilmember Thompson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so the um, jobs for King County that it estimated looked a lot higher than our current capacity, or the jobs were very much on the low end of that. Um, mm -hmm. Is that something that we would rectify then in our next comp plan update? It's, it's kind of hard to say at this point, since we don't really know where our target's going to end up. Um, so it's kind of, it's kind of hard to answer that right now. And part of that is because we did see so much job growth job growth already. Um, but I guess the short answer is potentially, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Deputy Mayor Zorns. Uh, in June, will we get kind of an update on what you came up with before you submit it? Uh, I can check with Mike on that, and I'm I'm sure he'd be more than willing to provide updates even maybe sooner than that, as we're getting closer to having more specific numbers. That's perfect, perfectly fine. I, you know, would like to know what 
what it looks like when we get to that point at some point. Yeah. And then the other thing that keeps going through my mind is that we don't know what 2021, 22 is going to do. So we've got these mm -hmm. ambitious targets, but the economy could blow that right out of the water. Is there flexibility or grace with that? If we're not meeting those yeah, targets. that has come up with our meetings with King County thus far, just the uncertainty of what we might see in the in the future because of COVID, especially. Um, and there was some room for adjustment. They said that there is a um, ability to adjust the numbers in the future. Uh, I can't remember exactly what the mechanism was for that. Uh, they said it wasn't super common in the past, but obviously we're in a very unprecedented situation. So um, it does sound like there is some room for adjustment based on that. Right. Yeah. It, you know, I can see how in really extreme cases, this could put us between a rock and a hard place. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if no one wants to build it, we're not going to be able to meet those numbers. So, right. but thank you for this. This was good to have. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah, thank you. All right, uh, council committee reports. Does anyone have one to uh, report out? All right, seeing council member Thompson. Uh, I attended the regional law safety and justice committee this last week and um, it's notable because one of the things that was talked about was a community court. So we got to hear a little bit more about kind of how other, um, you know, folks in the area are using that as we get to discuss kind of what that looks like this upcoming year. Um, we heard some specific stats um, around um, women involved in the justice system and how to achieve more equitable, just outcomes out of it. Um, and that's what we talked about. All right, thank you. Seeing no others, uh, on to visitor comments. So in keeping with Governor Jay Inslee's emergency proclamation 20-28 regarding open public meetings, the city has accepted visitor comment in writing as well as accepted sign-up sheets for those who wish to speak at tonight's meeting. Written comments submitted to the city clerk no later than 3 p.m. today were forwarded to all city council members and are part of the record. So city clerk. Thank you, Mayor Olson. Uh, we received two written comments, one from Kim Berg of CBRE uh, regarding the Canyon Park sub area plan and development regulations, which is scheduled for a public hearing next week. We also received written comments from Roger Balanich um, regarding uh, the Canyon Park sub area plan development regulations. And I believe he also signed up to speak tonight. Um, and so with that, I will call on um, the first person who's asked to sign up to speak is Aaron Dwinnell. So Robin, if you could patch uh, Aaron in, please. Just give it a moment. Um, Aaron, I believe is a caller. And so I'm trying to ask him to unmute his phone. Hold on just a moment, please. Maybe I can. Hi, Hi good evening. This is Aaron Dwinnell. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Mr. Dwinnell, you'll have three minutes in which to speak. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Aaron Dwinnell. Um, I'm with Steelwave. I'm also on the board of uh, the Canyon Park Business Center Association, uh, representing about 65% of the owners at Canyon Park. Uh, I'm here to request that the city council slow down uh, its process and not approve uh, the Canyon Park sub area update next week. You know, the, the, the plan, the development regulations and the, and the plan to action ordinance need more work. Uh, this should be completed now before the council takes action. You know, um, for example, you know, the plan is not ready for adoption uh, from our perspective, given that, you know, the final EIS was just issued yesterday. We've really had inadequate time to review it, I think, prior to going into next week. Uh, you know, the plan is not clear regarding what the transportation improvements will be provided, you know, by when and by whom. Several of the proposed 
development regulations, you know, conflict with our existing CCNRs for the Canyon Park Business Center. The critical development regulations remain to be drafted as well. For example, the plan implementing regulations requiring commercial development to pay for affordable housing, uh, affordable housing fee, but the city has yet to begin, you know, the efforts to determine exactly what that fee is. Um, and then the planned action ordinance really lacks the specific direction you know, for identifying appropriate mitigation measures, particularly as it comes to the transportation impacts that we'll have on, on, on our park. So, you know, in closing, I, I, I hope that the city will not adopt the plan uh, over the objection of 65% of the owners. And, you know, as in the past, we're eager to work with the city, you know, to address and resolve uh, our concerns so the plan can move forward um, here in the future. So I really appreciate your time and then thank you for letting me participate. Laura, you're muted. Can you repeat that, please? Still muted. I'm sorry. Yes, uh, Karen, you have three minutes. I'll be in just a moment. I've asked her to unmute. I'm not sure. Maybe she might be having some troubles with that. Give her just a moment, please. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, you I apologize. Reasons. I was having technical difficulties. All right. Your, your um, time begins now. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Kara Martinez and I'm the president of the Canyon Park Business Center Owners Association. And as Aaron mentioned, the business park makes up more than 65% of the area within the Canyon Park Regional Growth Center. The association represents all the property owners within the park and they are very concerned about how this plan will affect them and their tenants. Our main concern is increased traffic congestion due to the sub area plan update without sufficient mitigation. Currently, it can take more than half an hour during the evening commute just to get out of the park due to congestion. We acknowledge the plan's focus on improving transit, but even your own transportation demand management goals estimate that 78% of people traveling to the sub area will use single occupancy vehicles. We're worried that they will be sitting in even more of a gridlock. We acknowledge that city staff have responded to some of our concerns and several important changes have been made to the development standards. We appreciate those efforts, but the plan we feel is incomplete and not ready to be approved by city council. Critical additional development regulations remain to be drafted, such as the affordable housing fee, which Erin mentioned, and the plan for proposed transportation improvements. Some of the documents have not been made available for public review and comment, like the cost estimate for the transportation improvements. Given our concerns, the Canyon Park Business Center Owners Association requests that the City Council delay approving the plan and direct staff to continue to work with us on our concerns. We're much in favor of growth and development. We look forward to engaging with the city to ensure that the proposed plan works for all the stakeholders in Canyon Park. Excuse me, Canyon Park. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we have Roger Blanich. I hope I said that correctly.
Roger is also a phone caller. I've asked him to unmute, but I think there's a delay. Give it just a moment, please. Thank you. Uh, this is Roger Balanich. Hello, thank you. You have three minutes oh. for to speak. Okay, uh, Mr. Mayor and members of, the, uh, members of the City Council, I submitted a letter today uh, that outlines pretty much what I want to talk about, uh, and I won't repeat it. Uh, Aaron and Karen have given a testimony that I support, and uh, we have submitted as an owner's association, and I'm on the board uh, as the original developer of Canyon Park, for that matter. Uh, and I think our correspondence and our appeals by our association speaks uh, very well to the issues that we uh, are confronting with, with uh, the plan. Uh, I developed Canyon Park Shopping Center 42 years ago, and I started uh, uh, the business park uh, about 40 years ago. And uh, it's now Canyon Park is located uh, in the path of a dynamic growth on the east side. And you realize that by very recently Google announcing another campus and it's going to get here at Canyon Park, but it's mostly going to be about redevelopment. Uh, the, the, there's no vacant property in Canyon Park except the teachers project, uh, which I happen to be working on. But uh, it seems that for all the matters that we've addressed as an association, it seems like this city is following uh, an urban village of some sort, as opposed to a dynamic business part. And I don't think we're gonna see any redevelopment, as I stated in my letter, for at least 10 years or so to, to meet the transition that, uh, that is about the economic dynamics of the area. And I don't think it'll be, it could be possibly fulfilled through uh, with the uh, comp plan uh, that's uh, before you. So thank you very much. If I have any questions or anything. Thank you. Um, I, that's all I have on my list, Mayor Olson. Um, I don't know if anybody else would like to speak. Yeah, the, uh, let's see. Does anyone else in the audience wish to speak? If so, please use the raise hand function on Zoom and we will call on you. I'm not showing anybody raising their hand. All right, thank you. So we will move on to our next item. So it looks like we have our public hearings and we'll start off with 20-159. It's a public hearing and consideration of interim ordinance suspending BMC 12.32.120, concurrent review of other required permits and site plan review. So I'll now open the public hearing and we will turn it over to Community Development Director Michael Catterman. Hi, this is Jeff Smith, Development Services Manager. I think I'm taking this one. Um, I hope I'm not upstaging my boss. <laughs> um, uh, thank Go you. Ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> okay, I didn't. I'm not sure. I was a little late to the game. Okay, no worries, no worries. Uh, thank you, Mayor Olson, members of the council. Thanks for your time, appreciate it. Uh, this ordinance is an interim ordinance that will temporarily suspend a section of our municipal code um, you mentioned it earlier, 1232-120. Um, this section of the code requires that uh, site plan reviews be completed prior to submittal of, of construction documents, construction applications, such as some uh, civil engineering things and building, building uh, permit applications and that sort of thing. 
Um, the, the, this came about because the State Building Code Council has um, been trying to update the State Building Code from the 2015 code to the 2018 code. And that, that the goalpost of that change has really kept moving because of COVID. Um, it was originally scheduled to be uh, updated in July, July 1st of, of 2020, which is typical. It usually gets updated uh, July 1st. They moved it back, I believe, to November 1st, and then and now they've moved it out to February 1st. And this, this can create a challenge to developers and builders who are trying to design a project to the proper building code at the time. And because we require the, the, the site plan review to be completed prior to them submitting those things, it has made it really difficult to try to figure out sequencing and figure out scheduling for that. And so what we've asked you to do tonight is, is adopt an interim ordinance. This is valid for six months or until you uh, decide to change it um, um, to suspend that requirement so that this will allow uh, some of our applicants and, and developers to uh, submit their building permit applications prior to uh, getting their site plan approval, which ostensibly might be prior to the change in the in the building codes. And so this we, we see this as a as a a benefit and a and a and an an assistance to both the our our customers and, and our staff who who have been kind of like chasing a moving target. And so that's what this ordinance is all about. And we recommend that you approve this ordinance tonight. Thank you. All right, City Clerk, were there any comments received? There were not. All right. Does anyone have any comments or questions? All right. Deputy Mayor Zorns. Uh, it, just a quick question. If the building, the state gets their building codes into effect in February, does the city need time to transition to those? Uh, I, I was just trying to think why we would want to end it earlier than the six months out. We may not. That's up entirely up to you guys. We, we may not. Um, if there's no harm, no foul in letting it run out the full six months. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Council Member Dewar. I move the recommended action. All right. Council Member Agnew. I second that motion. All right, we have a motion by Council Member Dewar to adopt the interim ordinance to temporarily suspend application of section 12.32.120 of the Bothell Municipal Code with a second by Council Member Agnew. Any discussion on the item? Council Member Dewar? I just wanted to say that this it's, it's just common sense. This makes uh, a lot of um, sense to do and um, I thank staff for bringing it to our attention. All right, seeing no further discussion, city clerk. Please say yes or no when I call your name. Deputy Mayor Zorns. Yes. Council Member Thompson. Yes. Council Member McAuliffe. Yes. Council Member McNeil. Council Member McNeil. Mayor Olson. Yes. Council Member Doerr? Yes. Council Member Agnew? Yes. I'm showing it passes 6-0 with Council Member McNeil. Absent. Council Member McNeil, are you there? I will say yes, Laura. Can you say yes or no? Yes, Laura. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It passes 7-0. Uh, All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, all right, so on to AB 20-160. So a continued public hearing and consideration of an ordinance amending BMC 12.64, the downtown sub area outdoor space regulations. So I'll now open the public hearing and Director Catterman. Thank you, Mayor Olson and members of the council. Uh, I'll, I'll actually do an introduction this time. So this is a public hearing that's actually opened a few weeks ago and uh, we asked that it be continued at that time because we'd received some last minute 
uh, uh, requests and suggestions to modify the, the draft ordinance. And we have since had a chance to evaluate those and incorporate those into the draft that's before you this evening. So Dave Boyd, senior planner is gonna go through a presentation. Um, this is a, a project that's been in the works for a couple of years. And um, I know Dave has a lot of ownership of downtown and usually his work on downtown code amendments or labors of love, but this would not qualify as one of those because I've kind of put him through the ringer on some of these. This was a difficult one because there was a lot of different issues to balance here. Uh, and we've tried to, to achieve a balance that we think is, is workable. We fine tuned what we had in the code that was put in the downtown plan a little over 10 years ago. Uh, we think we've hit the sweet spot on this, but Dave is gonna go through the details of that. Uh, and then we can answer any questions that you might have. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dave. Okay, uh, thank you and, and uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and members of Council. I'm gonna share my screen, dive right into pre a short presentation. And you see that screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. Um, so as uh, Director Cotterman uh, said, uh, these are the downtown outdoor space uh, code amendments. Um, uh, and tonight's, the purpose for tonight uh, will be to review the uh, uh, proposed amendments, take public testimony, and to adopt the recommendation. The basis for uh, the downtown out outdoor space uh, uh, regulations is in the uh, downtown plans uh, community vision uh, which um, calls for a sequence of unfolding spaces that inspire people to walk and to linger in the center of the city. That's that's the heart of, of uh, behind uh, these regulations. And you can see in the lower left uh, is the uh, proposed open space network that's in the downtown plan. Uh, the larger image is uh, one uh, vision for how uh, downtown might uh, build out. And you can see the the scattering of, of green spaces uh, throughout throughout the, the this core area. The um, Planning Commission's review uh, really started with uh, the quality of the uh, open spaces that we've been getting downtown and and that was really the impetus for the code amendments. There were, were we had gotten comments that that uh, some of the uh, open spaces that were being uh, provided, the, the public spaces that were being provided um, uh, were not, uh, well, it was difficult to tell that they were pub public, that they weren't uh, as inviting as they could be. Uh, so that was the first fo focus for Planning Commission and, and um, when we started working on this over a year ago now. So uh, some things that were addressed were uh, uh, beefing up the requirements for seating in public uh, spaces, uh, addressing uh, blank walls, um, strengthening the uh, provisions for direct access from sidewalks and adding a provision for signage to make clear that these spaces are public um, and preferably having uh, giving developers some um, leeway and, and some encouragement to uh, be creative with that signage and, uh, and combine it with interpretive elements about either the history of the site or, or some other aspect uh, of the site. And then finally, um, again, uh, beefing up the uh, provisions for art and, and landscaping in these spaces. So these are all uh, images of, of some of the public space uh, for the Merck uh, in, on Main Street and 102nd. Um, we also dealt with uh, the quantity of open space. Uh, we, in our analysis, we found that townhome projects like uh, Dawson Square here and and, um, and the landing to the north of that were able to meet the current requirements uh, with passages that provided pedestrian connections through the development. Um, and uh, and th there are also some aspects of the, the quality of these spaces here. So we did pr propose, in addition to adding signage for these uh, passages, also to add some wayfinding so that a, passer, a casual passerby would, would uh, one, know that these passages are open to the public, and two, uh, have an idea of where, the, where they're led, whether to the library or volunteer park or, or uh, another street connection. Uh, and the numbers uh, on the bottom here show that uh, currently 
Um, well, the project provided uh, a little over 8,600 square feet of, of public space, again, uh, mostly in these uh, passages. The current requirement uh, based on uh, 150 square feet per unit um, was only uh, 6,750. 6, so clearly they, they were able to meet this requirement uh, uh, fairly easily. Um, the revised uh, planning commission's initial uh, recommendation was to switch from a per unit to a uh, uh, requirement based on the net floor area uh, and uh, set that at 9%, which would um, be a little bit less, would, would actually increase the amount required, be a little bit less than what was provided. And, and in fact, that is the recommendation. And uh, uh, along with that, uh, we, the Planning Commission is, uh, our staff is um, suggesting a revised uh, in lieu fee formula uh, that would uh, allow them to provide uh, 6,210 square feet on site and, and uh, provide the rest in an in lieu fee. We have uh, set the, the cost of the in lieu fee to um, match the amount it would uh, take to acquire based on the, the, the assessed value of the property and to develop the, the space. So there really is an incentive for developers, if, the, if at all possible, to provide the open space on site. Um, uh, another, so th that, that was a, a townhouse uh, exa example. Uh, the projects that have really been having uh, difficulty meeting the re requirement are the apartment projects. Uh, since it was, the requirement was based on uh, how many units, uh, these are much de denser developments. So they had uh, uh, quite a high uh, requirement. Uh, so this is the addition apartments. Um, they were only able to provide uh, a little over 6,000 square feet on site, uh, uh, far less than the requirement, less than half of the, the required 13,500. So with the new formula, uh, the requirement does go down modestly to uh, about 10,000 or 12,000, a little over 12,000 square feet. But the re, uh, revised in lieu fee formula would allow them to uh, provide about 9,500 square feet on site uh, and the rest as in lieu fees. So in, in this case, we're trying to, uh, um, in, one, encourage uh, these kinds of projects to provide more of the, uh, the public space on site and to limit the ability to use in lieu fee to um, uh, to a more uh, reasonable uh, level. Uh, along with this, um, uh, so we did this by changing the requirement uh, to be based on the net uh, floor area. Um, Planning Commission heard from uh, owners and developers of some of the smaller infill uh, lots in downtown uh, and the difficulties they had uh, of providing the required public space. So the Planning Commission uh, proposed to exempt projects that require less than 1,000 square feet of public uh, space. And, um, uh, and then as we were um, kind of working with these uh, requirements and the proposed requirements in Canyon Park, we established a, a gradated uh, in lieu fee allowance that, um, that we think is, is fair to all projects and doesn't create a, a significant step if, as you go uh, up in the, the, the different stages of uh, sizes of development. We also, uh, and the in lieu fee is intended to provide developers with some flexibility. Uh, not all sites are created equal and some sites are, are uh, definitely provo uh, provide some challenges uh, uh, in terms of providing the re required open space. So the in lieu fee provides some flexibility. We've also just uh, in practice, uh, we have allowed transfers of open space uh, um, as shown in this example from the 104 uh, uh, um, was had actually uh, wasn't able to meet all of its, uh, they were having uh, trouble meeting all of their uh, open space requirement. Uh, but the same developer was doing Six Oaks, which is in mostly in the downtown core and had very little uh, open space requirement. 
Uh, so we did allow them to transfer that and, and they use that uh, in part to uh, preserve the Six Oaks uh, or the namesake for the project. Uh, so we've actually made that explicit. We've codified that so that, uh, um, that it's understood that that is a, a possibility. Um, and we allow, uh, have allowed uh, in practice through code interpretations uh, required public uh, space to act as building in terms of uh, building frontage and, and build to corner uh, and, and wrapping requirements as we did at Six Oaks. Uh, and now we've, we've uh, codified that so that it's explicit. And uh, in terms of uh, providing flexibility, uh, we've had some projects that have come up that uh, um, uh, created pedestrian connections uh, this is a plan of the pop development uh, and showing a pedestrian connection that goes around the, the back side of the of the um, property. It's actually half on uh, school district property, but they've got an easement uh, in order to make that connection to Horse Creek Plaza uh, to the east. Um, uh, so we felt that was the only way that this this uh, open space, uh, the shared driveway uh, on the uh, on the west side of the development. Uh, really made sense as if it if it wasn't just a dead end connection but but connected through to the park um, and uh, otherwise but the that connection across the north side wouldn't have met the uh, dimensional requirements and half of it wasn't on their property so we've provided for uh, those kinds of connections to get credit uh, uh, toward their public space requirement another example of this is the walkway that the 98th avenue apartments have built and we're working on another uh, uh, proposal that'll create a new uh, trail connecting into the park at Bothell Landing, uh, and, and this will allow them to get credit for that. We've also addressed uh, sort of the durability of these uh, public uh, spaces by requiring easements uh, to establish the public space and, and, and uh, require the property owner to continuously maintain them. So other changes that uh, that were made uh, since the Planning Commission recommendation um, are re review. When we took this through Planning Commission, we we changed the terminology uh, from public space to uh, either outdoor space or from public open space to either just simply public space or uh, outdoor space uh, in order to uh, avoid confusion with our uh, parks and open space um, impact fees. Uh, and uh, following the uh, Planning Commission recommendation, we, we discovered that we hadn't caught all of those, those references. So, so there are a number of those that are uh, included that weren't in the Planning Commission recommendation. Uh, we, uh, Planning Commission uh, did add a, uh, in their recommendations, a, a, um, a private outdoor space requirement for the downtown core. Currently, the downtown core had no neither public or uh, private outdoor space requirements, but every project that's been built in the downtown or to date has provided uh, private outdoor space, either in, in the form of balconies or roof uh, decks. And we thought that those were valuable and uh, both in breaking up the, the facades of some of these larger buildings uh, and, uh, and providing uh, green roofs. And um, uh, so uh, the recommendation is to to add that uh, private open space requirement. And then we did also get a, uh, re related to that, a, a request from a developer uh, who was having uh, difficulty meeting that private outdoor uh, space requirement, uh, but uh, appeared to have a surplus of public open space. So we uh, provided a provision uh, for sites with uh, uh, constraints from critical areas to um, provide public space in, in lieu of uh, the, their outdoor space requirement. Uh, and then finally, the, the late changes that I referred to you to create this gradated scale, uh, similar to what we wound up uh, uh, proposing in Canyon Park, uh, so, that, uh, so that both areas, they, they have, there are slight differences in the, open, uh, the public space uh, needs uh, and the, the sizes of, of uh, parcels in downtown and Canyon Park, so there are some differences. Uh, but we wanted to make the basic requirements uh, uh, similar. So with that, uh, I'm uh, uh, happy to take uh, any questions or comments. Uh, and before 
uh, council opens uh, up the public hearing for public testimony and uh, deliberates and, and moves to approve the recommendation uh, as, amend as amended. I'd also like to acknowledge that uh, uh, Planning Commission Chair Kevin Kiernan uh, uh, is, join uh, is joining us tonight. I believe he's, he's with us here. So I'm gonna stop sharing now. City Clerk, were there any comments received? There were not. All right. Any questions or comments for David? Councilmember Thompson. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you for the presentation, David. Um, question for you. With the um, public open space requirement, do we know roughly what percentage of the um, most lots um, that requires? Uh, like of the entire floor area, if there's, you know, a hundred square feet, like how many square feet are required for public open space on average with the formula we have? Oh, there's, there's such a, a wide variety. We, we did do an analysis. Uh, we have kind of a spreadsheet uh, that shows the, uh, how the um, current requirement compares with uh, the, the new requirements. Uh, but the basic requirement is either um, for residential projects uh, is um, uh, nine or fifteen percent, depending on the the the, um, the zone that it's in. Okay. Um, in a normal downtown block, do you know roughly how many housing units you could fit in there? Well, uh, an example um, is the, the addition apartments, which is a half block development. Uh, there are 135 apartments uh, in the addition. Um, uh, the, and, and that's just a straight residential project. Um, Six Oaks has 203 units. So that's a full, essentially a full yeah. block uh, development. I guess my, what I'm getting at and kind of what my, my question and my concern with this overall in general is, is, you know, when we take that space and do something with it, that's, you know, obviously something else we can't do with that. Um, you know, if we required affordable housing instead of public open space, um, how many developers do you think would, you know, put those extra, call it 13, 14 units per block in instead of the public open space? Uh, that's, that's a tough question to answer, but I, I do know that we have one of the, uh, the uh, parcels that we evaluated in our analysis was the Imagine Housing uh, parcel uh, that is a, uh, an affordable housing project. That's the one that actually uh, appears like they're going to be able to um, exceed their requirement uh, uh, for public open space, uh, but uh, are, they're struggling to meet the private open space private. Uh, requirement. Okay. Uh, so they'll, they'll be able to use that, utilize that provision. Perfect. This this all seems good. I'll be voting for this. This seems like common sense changes we're making, and I support it. Um, I just I I struggle with requiring to use space for something other than affordable housing if we could do affordable housing. And I know that's not uh, part of what you're talking about tonight. Um, I'm just going to make that point and not talk anymore. Councilmember McAuliffe. You're on mute. There we go. All right, David, I want you to know how much I appreciate your support of our community and the people in downtown Bothell. Public spaces and art is really important for our community to feel that they have um, a richness and, and a togetherness. So I've listened to you speak very often at um, Ken, uh, Kenmore Bothell community meetings, and I really appreciate what you're doing because it, it's a richness for our community to have a place to gather. So thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Dewar. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Boyd. I just had um, kind of a quick question. Um, I, these all make perfect sense to me. But I, I wanted or wondered if you could give me a review of what happens with the in lieu fees and what uh, you know what their restrictions are around that. So one of the reasons we 
um, are doing these code amendments is that uh, certain some develop. Originally, the idea was that um, the in lieu fee would be useful or if not necessary for the smaller pro infill projects, and 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 it would also just generate very small uh, public spaces. Uh, the idea was that larger parcels should be able to, to meet their requirement uh, on site, uh, but um, in practice, um, we could see that uh, that that was uh, that was a challenge, and so we were constantly getting requests for in lieu fees, uh, significant in lieu fee fees for larger projects, and and uh, so we we felt that there was uh, uh, an argument for. Uh, reducing um, the requirement, uh, particularly for apartment projects. Townhomes uh, did seem to be able to meet the requirement uh, uh, quite handily. Uh, and that's what led to the, the uh, requirement based on the net floor area, as opposed to uh, the number of units. Um, but um, uh, the did that answer your question? I, I may have gotten off on a bit of a tangent. <laughs> I think you went off on a tangent. <laughs> I think I, if I could add a little bit to that, I think I think Dave answered part of the question in terms of restrictions on the funding. And this is one of the reasons that we looked at this uh, this fee. Uh, it does not have the same restrictions as the impact fees that we have for parks and open space. So we actually have much more flexibility in how we can use these. We could use it to acquire some of the properties. We could use it to enhance existing properties, you know, adding seating areas or landscaping. We could also use it to program certain areas. If we wanted to do that, we could have special events. Um, we don't have a system in place yet within the, the, the city structure to determine how those funds will be used, but they are separate funds. They're kept uh, separately and we'll be putting together an internal team that will then look at how we could use those funds most effectively in the downtown because they're for the downtown, they would be just used in the downtown. Can I ask a follow-up question? Um, do we ha currently have an account with fees that have been collected in it? And if so, how much? Yes, we do. Um, and I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm I don't sure have you that. can find out for me though. <laughs> yes, we will. Don't have that precise figure either, uh, but uh, we have actually um, convened a group, an interdepartmental group, to to discuss this uh, this possibility of of using um, the fees. Uh, and so we we've included parks, uh, public works, because um, and we in the code we've identified that uh, these uh, fees can be spent to um, enhance other public spaces, including uh, the public right of way. So. Um, so we, we have started uh, on that, um, but yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have a, a figure on what we've collected so far. One more question. So does city council have a role in um, deciding where those are spent or is that um, staff only decision? The way we have uh, set it up to date is that it will be a, a staff, uh, an interdepartmental committee of staff that will uh, review uh, options and, and make make decisions on on how to spend those funds. I would like to put a plug in for at least some council participation, but I, I in, in general, I'm excited that there's a fund and I think it makes a lot of sense to spend them on enhancements for um, public spaces that are within a certain walking distance from whatever projects are, are paying those in lieu fees. Um, and I just wanted to thank um, Kevin for being here from the Planning Commission and thank Planning Commission for all the work that they've put into this um, very sensible um, set of changes. So I will be supporting this. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Zorns. Uh, it's questions and comments. Echoing the thanks. Let me, if I don't remember to say thank you up front, I'll probably forget. So thank you to Planning Commission and staff for this. Uh, I noticed I liked um, the the things that were added from um, some developers as suggestions, but I had a, clar a clarifying question. The pedestrian connection offsite that it, the requirements for it to meet the um, open space would be not applied for pedestrian. Um, connections. Let me see if I can quote that. 
uh, allowing credit for off-site pedestrian connections, even if they don't meet the dimensional requirements, they would still be wheelchair appropriate, ADA appropriate, right? Yeah, any any um, uh, pedestrian connection uh, would have to meet the ADA requirements. Okay. Um, now, the connections into parks that have to follow topography, there's some uh, uh, allowances for that, uh, so they don't have to be uh, fully requirement, but as long as they, they within uh, practice and within feasibility, they, they provide accessibility, that, that would be required. Okay. I was reading between the lines and I thought that's what was going on, but um, I wanted to clarify that. So thank you. Um, and I appreciated the transferring of open space staying within the area. Um, I'm glad you guys caught that. Um, I, I will have to confess that when I saw the reduction, you know, both for townhomes and apartments, the reduction of open space kind of had me rattled a little bit for open space, but tell me if I'm understanding this correctly, by um, creating the in-lieu fees, do you have a sense that we will have a more effective open space with the, with the requirements that you're placing on in-lieu fees, that what was in place before wasn't creating an effective open space? Well, I think the uh, the amendments that we made to to improve the quality of the open spaces are gonna um, are gonna be the main um, thing affecting uh, the effectiveness of the open spaces. The um, uh, we really aren't doing this in order to generate a lot of in lieu fees. We're trying to right size this to to generate uh, a good quality spaces that that are proportionate to the development that's happening. So. Um, we're really hoping uh, to uh, reduce the reliance on in-lieu fees and, and get uh, more projects to provide the full requirement on site and, and make, make those spaces uh, better. Okay, that was my impression with that, but I, but I just wanted to clarify that. And then the last, just a comment, is that I noticed that maturity, uh, mature, sorry, I'm hearing it. Um, mature, existing trees should be preserved. It was on pages 27 and 38 of our agenda packet. And and I know that Six Oaks project initially started out as 12 Oaks project and it had to go down to Six Oaks. So this is just a comment uh, to that. I would, I would love it at some point if we look at um, putting some teeth in how we define uh, preserving mature existing trees that we do for large, large projects, but we don't for these smaller projects. So um, I appreciate what has been saved, but um, I would also at some point appreciate language that defines what these mature trees are. That's that's the sum of my comments and questions. And thank you, Dave. Thank you. Councilmember Dewar. I'm going to risk it and say I move the recommended action. Councilmember Agnew. I'm going to risk it and second it. <laughs> uh, so, so, so many risk takers around here. All right, so we have Councilmember Dewar with a, a motion to approve the proposed ordinance amending sections of the BMC Chapter 12.64 downtown sub area regulations with a second by Councilmember Agnew. Any discussion on the item? All right, seeing none, City Clerk. Uh, please say yay or nay when I state your, or yes or no when I state your name so I can hear it. Uh, Deputy Mayor Zorns? Yes. Councilmember Thompson? Yes. Councilmember McAuliffe? Yes. Councilmember McNeil? Yes. Mayor Olson? Yes. Council Member Doerr? Yes. Council Member Agnew? Yes. Passes 7-0. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you to the Planning uh, Commission and uh, the all the staff for their hard work on this item. 
All right, on to our next item, AB 20-161, uh, public hearing and consideration of approval of the ordinance for school impact fees for the North Shore School District. So I'll now open the public hearing and back to Director Catterman. Thank you, Mayor Olson. Uh, this is the third and final community development public hearing this evening. Uh, and I'm hoping we have someone from the North Shore School District. I was. I am not showing them on the line yet. Okay. Um, one was coming from another meeting and I just got an email that she is just wrapping up and the other one was supposed to be here already. So I'm not sure uh, I could start the presentation if you like mayor and uh, we could have them join us. I do have their presentation so I can go through it and do my best with the information that's there. I think I can muddle through most of it anyway. I think you'll do a great job. <laughs> Thank you for the vote of confidence. Let me uh, know if I can just remember how to share my screen. Is everyone seeing that okay? Okay, thank you. So presenting on behalf of Dree Ralph, who's the Capital Projects Director for the school district, as well as Denise Stiffarm, who's their legal counsel. Uh, this is the, the presentation that they have provided. And I just got a message that she's here. Do you have, Laura, do you have uh, either one of them in the waiting room? Give me just a second here. I, I am not showing them in the attendee list. She has her hand raised on Zoom. Mm -hmm. I show that as me unmute. in both places, but um, <laughs> you just let me unmute. Uh, Dree, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. I'm here. Okay. Great. I will. I will work your uh, your presentation. Can you see it? All right, I'm promoted to a panelist. This is exciting. <laughs> so mayor, mayor and Council, this is Dree Ralph, uh, Capital Projects Director for the North Shore School District, who's here to save the day and spare you from me having to do their presentation. <laughs> I will say um, there is one slight typo in your presentation that I'll address when we get to that page. Uh, and Denise Stiffarm will likely join us any moment now. Uh, she was double booked, but I'm very excited to be here. It's been fun to listen to your um, meeting thus far. There's a lot of things that uh, definitely impact the school district and that we um, have been part of. And uh, we really appreciate the role that the city of Bothell plays um, in our district. So with that, we can go to the first slide. So our capital facility plan is a six year plan that we update annually. So this gives us a chance to make modifications on a regular basis. Um, it is part of the Growth Management Act. Uh, the primary goal of it is to outline pro projected student enrollment, uh, to talk about our standards of service, uh, to demonstrate what uh, capital facilities we currently have in our inventory, to also look at our future needs related to growth, and then also talk about how we're gonna finance that growth and finance the plans that we have. Uh, and then one of the ways we do that is through impact fees. Uh, so we'll be talking about that tonight as well. Next slide. Uh, 
So our enrollment has grown by uh, over 3,000 students or 19% in the past six years. Uh, recently, our, we have averaged about 400 new students per year. Uh, the projected growth over the next two, six years is 960 students. This is a little bit of a slowdown, um, but not um, something that we think will be long lasting. I mean, as we saw when you were talking about your billable areas in Bothell alone, uh, there's definitely a lot happening in our region. In general, our middle school and high school grades continue to trend upward. And by the end of the six year uh, period, all of the grade levels again trend upward. Uh, this is a good time to mention the required caveats of anything that said in 2020, uh, which is the COVID caveat. Uh, the information that you'll see tonight is based on our numbers from 2019. Uh, fortunately, we do that yearly update, so there may be some anomalies in the data in upcoming years, uh, but for this year, we're really looking at the 2019 data. All right, next slide. So our typical methodology as we're looking uh, and talking about student enrollment trends is to talk about cohort survival or to utilize co cohort survival, uh, birth to kindergarten rates, and then to adjust based on develop residential development in the various jurisdictions that are part of our service area. Uh, you have heard about some of those developments tonight, so it makes sense that uh, those are what make up um, how we look at our projections. Next slide. This next slide just talks about our service standards. In uh, my background is in urban planning, so I like to think about this as our uh, classroom density. Uh, it, it's basically how many students do we anticipate being in a classroom? Over time, things uh, can change. Uh, the legislature can adopt different class size requirements that might lower the number of students we have per classroom, uh, which was uh, is highlighted on this slide in the kindergarten through grade three class size. Uh, some of our special programs are less dense uh, as far as students in the classroom. Special education is one of those, so we have less students per classroom. And then um, the other thing is uh, just the size of our buildings and kind of the demographics of various areas. There's just different trends in um, school construction and um, programs as they develop over time. All right, next slide. So this is our capital facility inventory slide. And uh, I put in this very dynamic picture of the expansion that we have now completed at Canyon Creek Elementary and Skyview Middle School. Uh, this is in Bothell, so some of you may have seen it. Uh, this Before I was planning director, I was um, the project manager for this project, so I'm very familiar with this site. Uh, and over the next year, you'll see this capital facility inventory that you see on your screen. You'll see that really expand, uh, including this Canyon Creek Elementary School expansion, which is a 30 classroom expansion. You'll also see the addition of Innovation Lab High School, which I'll talk about a little bit later, which is also in the city of Bothell. And then um, there will also be an addition of Ruby Bridges Elementary, which is just outside the city in the county. All right, next slide. We also have some non-student uh, facilities that include our administrative center on Montevilla. I'm sure many of you have been there at one time or another. Uh, the support services building that I work out of, our transportation building, which is also in the city of Bothell. 
Um, and then as mentioned in the last slide, these are the um, some of the sites that are in development. And finally, there's we have some undeveloped land currently, and we don't currently have those slated for development, but we are in the process of doing a facilities master plan, which will look at our growth and development over the next 20 years. Part of that process will be to look at some of these undeveloped properties. All right, next slide. Okay, this moves into our impact fees. And I wish I had a better picture that didn't have the cones in the front, but I very much wanted to put a picture of Innovation Lab High School on this slide as we begin to talk about impact fees. Uh, as you can see by the bullet points on the slide, we do follow the Growth Management Act. Um, Impact fees are applicable only to new residential development. They're, play, they're based on planned growth. They can't be used to address existing system definish, deficiencies. Um, but with that said, um, they're a very important part of how we fund what we need as a district. So Innovation Lab High School actually just opened um, at the end of September, uh, beginning of October with about 135 students enrolled. Unfortunately, the students have, have not been inside yet, but we're very excited uh, to have them back as soon as possible. But this project is really interesting. It's an adaptive reuse building in the Canyon Park um, business park. It will house up to approximately 550 students. At this time, 130 are enrolled. Uh, for this first year of enrollment, we only allowed enrollment for grade 9 and grade 10 students, but it will be fully um, four grades when it's being used uh, at capacity. And as an adaptive reuse building, it's been interesting. Michael and his staff and I have done a lot of, uh, had a lot of conversations about how to make this uh, project possible. And it was funded um, primarily by impact fees, the interior remodel portion of this project. So basically our impact fees have allowed us um, to provide almost 550 spots for students. And I think it's um, a real demonstration of how school districts need to be creative when it comes to our space planning. And we need to um, you know, work with our jurisdictions. And uh, you started tonight with the buildable lands analysis. Uh, I think that highlights some of the difficulty we have in procuring land for some of our more traditional um, school sites. So coming up with options like this, I think is definitely the wave of the future. All right, next slide. Some of the requirements for eligibility for impact fees is that we are showing projected enrollment growth over that six year period, that we identify capacity need at, a, the grade, at the grade of the project that we're building. And, that, um, and that's based on the standard of service district-wide. Oh, I see Jennifer's in the dark again. She's <laughs> need to wave her arms. <laughs> there we go. Uh, the construction projects that we anticipate over the six year plan um, have to address those capacity needs. So this is a picture of the exoskeleton of Ruby Bridges Elementary, which also was completed and opened in the actual building opened October, although we had students start uh, meeting their teachers online a little bit earlier than that. Next slide. This is how we determine um, our fees for um, 
for our impact fees. And we really follow the outline in RCW 8202. And um, as we go through that fee determination, we conclude it with the discount by 50%. We can go to the next slide. I think I actually might have missed the typo. That's cool. Uh, in the 20 fee formula, um, you saw we used the growth related projects of Ruby Bridges Elementary that we just talked about. The capacity addition at Skyview and Canyon Creek. Uh, the phase two capacity at Maltby. So where Ruby Bridges Elementary School, that site, um, we're considering um, building a middle school on that site as well. And then the last project we haven't mentioned yet is the concert hall at Inglemore High School. This is currently under construction along with the concert hall itself. There's several classrooms for music instruction. And then finally, Innovation Lab High School that we just talked about. All right, last slide. So every year as we analyze our fees, uh, we base them on the best information we have at the time. So last year, our single family dwelling unit fee was $20,000. $92. This year you see there's a slight decrease to $17,080 per single family dwelling unit. And then um, in a similar trend uh, with our multifamily dwelling units, last year um, or our previous fee was $3,540. And the data for this update indicates that it should be $1,504. So that is what we have proposed for our update this year. That is it. All right, city clerk, did we have any public comment on this item? We did not. All right. Any questions or comments? Councilmember Thompson. The music facilities at Inglemore look like they're going to be amazing. That is super cool. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to say I'm not used to people coming and um, asking us to lower fees. So <laughs> I know this seems phenomenal to me. Like I, I don't know why I would say no. No, we'd like to pay more. Thanks. <laughs> I, will, I will vote yes. I will say we're very excited about the concert hall. It's right in the middle of construction. We poured the slab last week and we really expect that to be a district wide facility. We hope that um, you will use like Innovation Lab High School is a district wide high school. Um, we really hope that you'll make your way to Kenmore and schedule some great activities for the city of Bothell. Give my kids a few years, they'll probably be there. That'd be awesome. <laughs> Council Member McAuliffe. Thank you. Um, I'm really excited about what North Shore School District is doing to serve all of our different students' needs. So Innovative High School, the Ru Ruby Bridges um, High School, the middle school coming on. You know, I, I look over the city of Bothell and in my area particularly, there is so many apartments going up and so many homes going up. You are really challenged yep. with your growth, with your growth. But it sounds like you're doing all the things that you need to do to serve our, our, our students. My big concern today, of course, and I know it's yours, is that how do we serve our students today who are at home yep. and unable to get the services they need? Because some of them have a great amount of support. Mm -hmm and some do not. So I just um, began to serve on um, the North Shore School District Foundation Youth Advisory Board. Awesome. And what I'm hearing from the young students that are on this advisory board is we need to have some options for students so that they're not just staying home on, on a laptop. Yeah. So I'm working on that and I hope that, that, that we can help those students who need help. 
I hope so too. I have to say it's been absolutely impressive to see how the foundation and other community groups have really stepped in to help our students as much as possible. Um, there's that ubiquitous, unprecedented word that gets thrown out around a lot. Um, but this certainly is. And the resilience of our students is just overwhelming and um, very inspiring to me. Yes, and I want to compliment you and your staff and Superintendent Reed for what you're doing for these students in this difficult time. Thank you. Councilmember Dewar. Thank you. I just wanted to express excitement about the Inglemore facility as well because I have an Inglemore student. And someday when this pandemic is over, she will enjoy those facilities. So. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much for your work. And um, I agree. Uh, why would I say no to lowering fees? Right. <laughs> Deputy Mayor Zorns. A uh, really quick comment. Uh, Bree, thank you for this presentation. You made me homesick for my other my other day job, which is substitute teaching. Um, yes. when, I know, I love it. And when COVID, COVID hit and I was so excited for the grand opening of Skyview, you know, that split. I was, I was slated to go. I was so excited to get, I, okay, I did walk in it before the big, you know, grand opening, but I wanted the party and the, the COVID's taken so much, so much away. And, you know, I miss seeing the kids. I miss being in my favorite schools, which are all favorite, but don't tell them. <laughs> I, was, I was starting having a little pity party here and I thought, but, but we have parents here on council who have kids who can't go to school and I know that they miss it more. So yeah. I'll be, I, I, I've never missed normal so much. Yeah, well, we, we miss uh, having our students on site too, as creative and awesome as they have been online. We're all very, very, very excited to get um, students back in the building, oh. especially those of us who build the buildings. Oh, we really I want students in them. I bet, I can't wait to see Innovation High School. I, I bet it's absolutely fabulous. So, and I'm glad you worked with uh, our uh, planning department on make, making that uh, take shape. And so you're, you're starting, it's ninth and 10th grade are starting in that, and then you will add on that next year to work up to the 550? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Bria. I bet it's been a long day for you, and I'm looking forward to voting yes on this, too. No Thanks. worries. Council Member Dewar. I'm going to finish my streak with a <laughs> motion to, to approve the recommended action. All right. Uh, Council Member McAuliffe. Second. All right. So we have a motion by Council Member Dewar to adopt the proposed ordinance uh, with fees at the level requested by North Shore School District with a second by Council Member McAuliffe. Any discussion? All right. Seeing none, City Clerk. Please say yes or no when I state your name. Deputy Mayor Zorns? Yes. Councilmember Thompson? Yes. Councilmember McAuliffe? Looks like she said yes, yes. <laughs> Councilmember McNeil? Yes. Mayor Olson? Yes. Councilmember Dorr? Yes. Councilmember Agnew? Yes. Passes 7-0. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bree, for your presentation. Thank you, Director Catterman, for uh, being an excellent slide manager. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Dree. Thanks, everyone. All right. Well, that brings us through all of our public hearings for tonight. Uh, looks like our last item is Council Conversations. Councilmember Thompson. I'm just glad Councilmember Dewar is back because, you know, I actually had to second some of Tom's motions last week and like that's, it's a lot of work. So thank you, glad you're back. You're welcome. <laughs> Councilmember McAuliffe. 
Yeah, I'm mute. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to compliment um, Council Member McNeil, who I know is struggling with his condition, his health condition, and is still attending the meeting and doing his thing. So, thank you, James. Welcome. Thank you. Council Member Dewar. I just wanted to float the idea of some sort of council participation in, um, depending on what the the uh, in lieu fees are, having having some representation at the table for those decisions. Um, I think it'd be good, even if we just have one council member to kind of weigh in and also kind of track and see where those funds are spent. Um, I don't know. I'd be interested to see what other council members agree with me and think that's a good idea. Council member Agnew. Yeah, I'd support that motion. I also uh, was listening to Dave and uh, he was saying that they're having an issue with getting some art into Bothell. And I wonder at some point in time, if we won't consider uh, putting a 1% fee on all new construction specifically for artwork and Bothell. So just something to think about. Deputy Mayor Zorns. Uh, yeah, I, uh, Council Member Dewar's comment of having more community input. Um, and I think, you know, councils that interface between the community and how the staff is steering the ship, um, having some some input on bigger projects, not not necessarily where you're going to place a park bench, but if it's a bigger project with the in-lieu fees, it would be nice to have some council input on that. Council Member Dewar. I just wanted to um, say that I agree with Council Member Agnew's suggestion. I think um, more art is always a lovely thing and um, makes our community vibrant in ways that that um, really nothing else can fill that kind of void and and kind of bring the community together. So I fully support something like that, that idea. I'd love to explore it more. Council Member McAuliffe. Uh, yes, um, there already is a 1% fee on building for art. And that comes, uh, isn't that correct? I believe it's only public projects. On public projects. Okay. Not on the private. Okay, I understand. And then um, I guess I want to ask this question then when we're talking about this. What does our art commission do and do they have some input into into our public public projects or private projects i guess i say council member Agnew. you know we we've never really uh delved into the private sector because we don't have any say in it uh they do on the public sector uh they just and uh, council just endorsed the artist that is going to do the work on station 42 and 45. So uh, they are involved in that a lot, but we've never been involved in the private sector at all. Right. You're on mute. If you're. So I'll just chime in. Uh, I think, uh, you know, how council member Dewar said, having some participation by council uh, on on some of the, I guess the the meteor, the larger projects, kind of how deputy mayor Zorns uh, was mentioning. I think, you know, just smaller little improvements here and there. I think those are, you know, uh, but for the larger ones, yeah, it'd be, Great to have some participation and opportunity to be that conduit. Kind of a quiet crew.
Do it, Mr. Mayor. Are we? Are we? <laughs> Deputy Deputy Mayor Zorns. Well, I I will tell. I, I'll just throw out to council. Um, at some point, I need you to talk turkey with me, because I I having ways for communities, neighborhoods, and Bothell to identify and encourage. Um, encourage their sense of belonging to Bothell is really important to me. And, and, I, and I know it is for, for you guys too. And for, for me, one piece that the, I, I'm like a dog on a bone uh, is the, the sign blades that old um, neighborhoods, neighborhoods who don't have monuments can identify themselves with. Um, and it might be something that um, our, um, our uh, historic board could deal could ident identify those districts to me that makes sense in in where the neighborhoods would pay for their own signs that would not come out of city funding um and i'm stuck there so i think it's a great idea but i realize that there might be some other ideas for helping busy people in the city have, develop a sense of community. So my request to you is if, if you have an idea of how to build a sense of community for cheap, um, share it because I need something to chew on besides the sign blades. Otherwise, I'm going to be back bugging you guys where you'll tell me to go away or all right, we'll figure it out. Um, so there's that. And then the other piece at some point I'm going to be buzzing in your ear about is the only tree preservation that we have for Bothell are for big projects and big projects. I, think, I believe it's over an acre in size. Um, and even we don't really have anything for um, uh, smaller lots. And we have a lot of trees that are huge trees. And they, we have surrounding cities that have code that protect uh, what they might call historic heritage trees or um, Woodenville has four inches. I think that's a little restrictive where you have to have permits. But at some point, um, I think as a city, we ought to find a way not to be heavy handed, but to, to be a little more proactive in how we um, protect trees. So if you have ideas uh, on that as, as time rolls on, not today, not next week, but um, if you have the bandwidth to, to noodle it and think about it, um, I would love to hear your thoughts. That's it. Council member McAuliffe. Thank you. Oh, whoops. Am I you're on? Good. Yep, you're good. Okay, so, so I find this really interesting. First of all, I really liked that you named Cougar Way after Bothell High School, right? I thought that was a really important thing to do. Um, I don't know if the other high schools, Ingemore or any of the other ones have that kind of a significant signage, but I think that's important. You know, I served on the Bothell Arts Council and we did some things kind of like what you're talking about, Jeannie. We put figures of people downtown, you know, side East drug and, and different people who were important to us, Shannon's. But the new people that come to town do not know the history. So it's difficult when we do it and then someone new comes and says, what's that mean? So I think we have to consider the future of art and how that impacts people and how we can include them so that they have a history maybe, but maybe not something they don't understand. It's just interesting to watch how art changes and how people perceive it. So on 101st and Main, we did the historical, uh, Bothell Arts Council did the historical um, mural, which shows the history of Bothell. I think that's important, something like that. But if I was gonna name the, the, the neighborhood by me, which would be Munger, who would know? Who knows Munger? <laughs> okay, I'll let you talk. No, no, I, I agree. But I, I will tell you, we live on the same hill as the Pioneer Cemetery. And almost, I, I walk it every day. And almost every time there is someone who either lives around the downtown area, or who's just look or, or who's new to Bothell, 
who is wandering around looking at the different tombstones and headstones. And, and I feel like I'm starting to feel like an old person because I'll be like, and you know, Dr. Chase is buried down there and Chase House is down there and that's down there in the university. But there are people who really, there are people who are new to this area who are just really craving a connection with the history of Bothell. So I, I just see signage as, as maybe one of those pieces, but but you're right, art is also a piece of that. And and there are people out there who do want to be connected and feel rooted into Bothell, which is a good thing. Councilmember Dewar. I just wanted to go back to the in lieu fee thing and make sure everybody that wanted to weigh in did. Because I wanted to know if I had four people in support. So I had Liam and Tom and myself. I couldn't remember if anybody else said that they were interested. Oh, okay, Jean. And I'll, I'll be a fourth or a fifth. Okay, cool. Thank you. I think we should name every protected bike lane in a neighborhood <laughs> after the neighborhood. So, you know, we can have the Maywood Hills protected bike lane. <laughs> I second that. <laughs> Council member Agnew. Disregard. <laughs> All right. Council Member Dewar. Continuing my streak, I motion we adjourn the meeting. <laughs> Council Member Agnew. I'll second that one. All right. Uh, everybody thumbs up, nods, cheers, smiles. See you All right. Bye, everyone. Take care, Take James. Care. Get healthy, James. Happy healing. Everyone. Take care, buddy. Thank you. Have a good night. Get well soon. Thanks.